on everywhere. This is Pastor Robert Thibodeau. Welcome to another live broadcast of Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God. We are so blessed for you to join us today. You know, in preparing for today's study, I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, we're talking about one of my favorite biblical characters other than Jesus, and that's Abraham. Amen. And with Abraham, we have well, he's the father of faith, glory to God, and I'm a faith preacher, bless God, and I believe, God, that what we're going to study today is going to bless you, amen? Hello to everyone out there in Facebook land. We are live, streaming live over Facebook right now, and we want to welcome you to the program. Give us some love, give us some likes, give us some shares, and we're just so blessed that you can join us. Go, let's go before the word, the Father with a word of prayer before we get started in today's study of his word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for your word. Your word, which is Jesus to us. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are the word of God that was made flesh. And Father, we thank you that through his death, through his resurrection, we have been redeemed to you. We've been deemed as righteous in your eyes because of what Jesus did for us, taking the pain and the shame that belonged to us, becoming sin so we could become righteous. That through his death, burial, and resurrection, God the Father is glorified. Hallelujah. His word is always true. And Lord, we thank you that today, we, as we study your word, we are led by your Holy Spirit, that the words spoken are your words that all of the honor, all of the glory, all of the praise for all that is accomplished belongs to the Father in your name. And we pray this, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Join me in our profession of faith, commonly referred to as the Apostles' Creed. We do this each week just so that you can hear these words that have anchored the souls of so many people down through the centuries and that it's a secure of our faith. And say these words out loud. Praise God. Let them go through your own ears, down into your heart, and come back up out of your mouth, and that produces faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word. Hallelujah. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended up into heaven where he sits now, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from where he shall return soon to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Last week, we started a series called God is Our Source. And I want you to understand that God is our source if we look to him in faith. He is not our source if you just want to look to him for worldly gains, worldly desires. You cannot look to God to deal with you in a righteous manner if all you want are unrighteous things. You know, uh, I believe in healing. I've laid hands on the sick, seen them instantly recover. We have testimonies of it, documented evidence of it. But God's not going to heal you so you can sit around and watch television with no pain. God will heal you as long as you submit to his will. He may call you to go to Kenya or Zimbabwe or Mexico or to your next door neighbor. But you have to be willing and obedient to go and do what he says to do. If you're not willing and obedient, what gives you the right to even ask him to heal you? If you're not willing and obedient to do what he says to do, then that means you're in disobedience. If you're in disobedience, should you expect anything from God? 
So folks, as we study these things today, you need to remember that. Amen? And turn with me. We're going to be studying today. I want to end up over at Genesis chapter 22. Uh, but before we get there, I want to show you, you know, we, we just talked about Abraham. Let's go and look at how many times God spoke the promise to Abraham. You know, we, we, we could talk about, you know, Genesis chapter 22 about, uh, you know, when God offered Isaac, or when Abraham offered Isaac on the mountain to God as a sacrifice. And, and yeah, we're going to get there. All right. But what made Abraham believe God? What was it that made Abraham believe God could raise Isaac from the dead? What was it that made Isaac willingly go with Abraham and lay down on that offer, on that altar? I mean, stop and think about By this time, Abraham's pushing 100 plus. I mean, we know he's over 100. He's probably about 120. Isaac, you know, probably 17, 18, 19, somewhere in that area. I, I have a feeling Isaac could have took him. Amen. But we're going to get there. I want to show you some things that secured this belief, this faith that was counted to Abraham's righteousness, that allowed him to do the will of God, and which allowed Jesus to become our sacrifice. Amen. Turn with me in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The whole, oh, that was 11, I need 12. Okay, now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of the country, from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, they still hadn't had any kids. He was 75 years old at that point in time. Go over to chapter 13. Verse 14, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look for the, now remember, he hadn't heard from God while the whole time that he and Lot were together. He hadn't heard anything. Lot separates from him. And as soon as Lot has separated from him, verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And for all the land which you see, to you I will give it, and to your seed, and to your descendants forever. And I will make your seed, your descendants, as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, that's how many seed you shall also be numbered. In other words, that's how many your descendants are. He still hadn't had any kids. It says, Arise, walk through the land, walk the length of it, the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. Still didn't have any kids. Turn to chapter uh, 14, verse number 18, I believe it is, 18 to 20. This is after Lot had been taken prisoner. Abram uh, had a few hundred men that he had trained in his household, trained men of war. He had servants trained to fight. He had his own little militia. And when he heard that his nephew, the only son of his brother, had been taken prisoner, he went after him. And he recovered all. And he came back. The king of Sodom came to meet him. And Melchizedek also came to meet him. Melchizedek is Shem. And I don't have time to trace that bloodline. You go back and, and know in the flood, the three sons, you seen one was cursed. The other one was the descendants of Edom and all that. And the other one was Shem. Only one kept the faith and the promises that God declared as a blessing onto Noah and his children. Only one remained in the faith. And he dwelt in what is now called Jerusalem. At the time it was called Salem. And his title was Melchizedek, King of Salem, or King of Peace. Amen. He's the Melchizedek was King of Peace. 
And he's the one who is now old. And you can trace, and I've done this. I don't have time to go into it today. But if you trace the years that from Noah, the time of the flood, uh, the time that the, the flood ended and, and they came out of the ark, from that point forward, if you trace it out and you follow the genealogical history, you can see that Shem, Melchizedek, was still alive in this day of Abraham. He's looking. Who is living by faith? Who of my descendants is living by faith? That I can, the way to pass on the blessing was to lay hands on someone and impart the blessing to them. And he's looking, you know, and we've seen that, you know, God is using Abraham, nobody else. Shem, or Melchizedek, sees that also. And that's when he heard that one of his great-great-grandchildren has just defeated all these armies. It has to be God. He's seen God moving in that area, if that could happen. And he wants to come and meet Abram. So he comes up to Abram, and he blesses him in verse 19. And it says, Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed the Most High God, or blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave to Melchizedek tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, and take the goods for yourself. All the king wanted back was servants. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand to the Lord, to Jehovah, to, to Yahweh. I've lifted my hand up to him, who is the possessor of heaven and the possessor of earth. All that is God possesses, even you, old king. And says, I will not take from you even a shoelace so that nobody can ever say they are the ones who made Abraham rich or Abram rich. So he gave him tithes of all, gave Melchizedek tithes of all. Sodom says, hey, I'm going to bless you too. And he says, I don't want what you have. I don't want an earthly blessing. I don't need anything you can give me. Take everything. But he already gave tithes of everything to Melchizedek. Now you can have all that's left, except what the men who went with me, you know, that, that they possess. So here we see the blessing that God gave to Noah. And upon Noah's three sons, one ended up being cursed. The other one didn't want anything to do with the blessing. And then Shem, who's now old and looking at who he can... Uh, Pass this blessing on to. He's seen Abram, and now he passed that blessing on to him. Turn over to chapter 15. And we'll just skim quickly through this entire chapter. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I, he's talking about God himself, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Hallelujah. That's promise number three now given to Abram. And Abram said, Lord God, Jehovah, Yahweh, will you give to me all these things? Seeing I am childless and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, look, to me you've given no seed. I mean, you promised me seed. You promised me children, God. What's up? You promised me these children. Up to now, I have no children. So one born in my house is going to end up being my heir. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels, your own descendants. 
shall be your heirs. There's another promise, number four. And then he brought them forth, or brought Abram forth and said, Look towards heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, That's how many your seed shall be. Promise number five. And he believed the Lord when the Lord said that to him and showed him that. And that's what was counted to Abram for righteousness, is when he finally believed the Lord. Hallelujah. That his own children that came from his own bodies, his own body, that's the children that God has promised him, that they be as numerous as the stars of heaven. And he said to him, I am the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, that brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldees to give to you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, how shall I know that I will inherit this land? It didn't belong to him at the time. I mean, it had the people, you know, he couldn't walk up to them and say, uh, excuse me, gentlemen, excuse me, can you all pack up and move? Uh, my God, Yahweh, Jehovah, has told me that I am the owner of this land and you all are trespassing. Can you leave now? Yeah, that, that probably wouldn't have gone over too well. So he's asking, him, how, how can I know I'm going to own this? I mean, how's this going to take place? How can I know that what you're telling me is true, God? And God said to him, let's do a covenant sacrifice. And he explains to him how to do it. And he says, know of a surety that your seed shall be a stranger in this land, a land that's not theirs yet. And they shall serve these people and shall afflict them for 400 years. But the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they will come out with great substance. Oh, they'll possess all of it. Praise the Lord. And you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they will come here to this land again. And the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet been filled. And it came to pass that as the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, a burning lamp that passed between the pieces of animal carcass that was the sacrifice. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed, unto your descendants, I've given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Canaanites, the Hadites, the Pezzarites, the Rephims, that's the giants, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergeshites, and the Jebusites. You're going to possess all of their land. Now, I want to talk just for a second about the covenant. In the day in which Abram lived, up until really modern times, uh, you know, you go back to the early 1900s out in the, the wild west of the United States, Covenants were still in force with the Indians. And what happens? There can be no greater covenant than, well, let me explain how the covenant started. If you were a farmer and you had grain, sheep belonged to another person, cattle. Uh, someone else had lots of pure wells of water, maybe springs of water in their land. The sheep need grain. They also need water. The farmer needs water for his grain in order for the fields to grow. He also needs sheep for wool and to eat. And the person who owns the land needs food to eat and sheep and uh you know, wool and things like that. So they would enter into covenant with one another. I'll give you, you know, so many sheep each year. If you'll give me the water I need for my herds of sheep and for my family and I, I'll give you a few sheep each year for the grain to feed the rest and for my family and I to eat. The grain farmer 
says, I need water for my field, so I'll give you some grain in exchange for water. And then he turns around to the sheep farmer and says, if I give you the, the grain, you'll give me sheep so I can have wool to make clothes with and, and food to eat. And the person who has the water says, hey, I need food to eat. I'll give you water in exchange for grain, and I'll give you water in exchange for a few sheep each year. So they all enter into covenant with one another. If some tribal herd herdsman group comes from another country that's not part of their little covenant clique there in that area and decides he's going to wage war and try and take the, the grain fields or take the water wells or take the sheep fields, they have all entered into covenant with one another. That you come against one, you come against all. And that's how they're able to protect themselves. In order to enter into that covenant in that day and time, they would have a huge festival, we'll call it a feast. And each would bring things that was precious to them. And they would each bring, uh, the, the sheep person would have some, you know, so the, the finest sheep brought to the sacrifice. The water owner would bring some of the purest water. The grain farmer bring some of the first harvest from the field, the best grain. And they would exchange it with another. And there would be an offering made. The person who had the water would offer pure water, pour it out on the ground. The person who had the grain would offer the grain offering and put it into the fire. The person who had the sheep would slaughter the sheep and there'd be bloodshed. And they would all enter into this covenant and walk through the elements of blood, taking some of the grain, eating some, throwing it in the fire, taking some of the water, drinking it, pouring it on the sacrifice, pouring it into the fire. And together they've all offered something most precious. And they've all consumed the other's offering as well. So now they have their offerings in them exchanged among them, and they are now in covenant with one another. Fast forward into the early 1900s in the Wild West. The Indians would become blood brothers with one another. They would have the little clashes among themselves, but then when their peace treaties were made, they would have a, a festival, a feast, uh, and Members of both tribes would come together and a sacrifice be made. And they would actually cut in their hand, across the palm of their hand, and enter grasping one another, making covenant, the mixing of blood. And they would say, my blood is now your blood. Your blood is now in my blood. We are blood brothers one with another. That's how they made covenant. But there was a cutting and a shedding of blood that did it. White men used to be your handshake was your bond. You, when you shook hands over the deal, you're symbolizing what the Indians were doing, really. You shook hands one with another and saying, we have us a deal. I'll uphold my end of the bargain. You uphold yours. And there was a covenant. A man's word was his bond. To go back to the Indian uh, analogy here that I gave, when they entered into blood, you know, they cut the palms of their hands, entered into covenant one with another, and as those cuts healed, there'd be a scar there. So as uh, something was going on and possibly another conflict was about to happen over a skirmish or something like that, the leader of one tribe would go out, and you've seen the old Indian, Indian cliche in the movies, you know, how, Okay. What they were doing, they were showing the other person, I have entered into a covenant. Here is proof. Here is my scar. As they held up their hand, I don't know if they said how or not, but they would hold up their hand, and the other would hold up their hand, and they say, okay, we are in covenant, so let's work this deal out. All right? We're not going to fight each other. Let's just work this deal out. Now, in Abraham's day, Covenant meant to the death, basically. If someone promised that our families are now in covenant, your family, my family, I use the example of the, the sheep herder, the grain farmer, and the guy who owned the water in the area. We are in covenant one with another. And if someone from my family breaks this covenant, the other two have the responsibility of coming to that family 
And that family, in order to make restitution, must kill the one who broke the covenant. If they can't find out who it is, then they have to find one to kill. That's how it is. That's how it was. But the point I'm trying to make is, and, and the one that would be selected was usually one of the sons of the chief. Because the chief wanted to make peace with these other tribes that they were about to go to war with. In order to prove his faithfulness. He didn't want to, it didn't want to appear as if we're about to be overwhelmed, so I'll tell you what, uh, get uh, Susie's youngest kid out here, the one that gives us a hard time all the time, one that steals stuff, bring him out here. We're going to kill him as a sacrifice to a people. No, that wouldn't work. In order to establish, reestablish the covenant relationship, in order to get everybody back into covenant with one another, the chief had to offer his son, usually the oldest son, the firstborn. Even though he hadn't done anything wrong, if they can't find out the person who caused the problem, and it was in danger of breaking that covenant relationship, then it was required that the oldest son of the tribe would be sacrificed in order to reestablish a covenant relationship between all the parties. Abram still didn't have any kids. We counted, what, five or six times God had promised him, you're going to have children. You're going to have children as numerous as the sand. You're going to have children as numerous as the stars of heaven. You're going to have some kids, and this whole land is going to belong to them. And Abram finally said, look, all right, God, I hear you. I believe it, but how can I really know you're going to do it? And that's when God says, we're going to go into covenant, boy. You and I are going to make covenant with one another. Here's what I need you to do. And he gave him the directions for preparing the sacrifice. All right, we got that far. As in verse 11, verse 10, Abram divided the sacrifice just like God said. And it's still daytime. And the birds came down upon the carcasses. The birds are like, hey, feast time. And they're circling and they're trying to come down and get some meat. And it says, and Abram drove them away. The birds over in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is talking about the sower sows the word. Some is sown on hard ground. Immediately the birds come to eat them up, eat the seed up. A little bit later on in that chapter, the disciples come to him and says, explain this parable to us. And Jesus said, if you don't understand this one, how can you understand anything I'm going to teach you? In other words, the keys are in the parable of the sower sows the word, right? And Jesus said, you know, the sower sows the word. So the word is the seed. And he said, when the word is sown into the stony heart of a man, who doesn't want to receive anything at all that we have to say about God. The devil comes immediately to steal the word out of their heart. He referred to the birds that came to steal the word out of the heart of man as the devil, and, and by extension, his demons. Come back to Abraham. God said, we're going to enter into covenant. You want to know how? You can believe my promises? We're going to enter into a covenant. One of the strong, is like signing a contract in your own blood, except you, God didn't have blood at the time. So he did, next best thing was have blood of nature. Remember, oh Lord, we studied last week where God uh, created the heavens and the earth over the course of the, the five days, the sixth day created man. And he said, Everything is so good. It's all good. Nature and man get along great. There is no strife. Adam named all the things that has names. Hallelujah. God gave everything to him. But when the sin came, the division came, the fall came, 
suddenly you got poisonous plants, you got po you know, animal, poisonous animals, snakes and stuff. You have bees that sting. You got animals that fight each other and fight man. Sin caused that division. And he says, in order to establish this covenant between God and Abram, he had to have nature provide the sacrifices because this is reestablishing God's original design that man is in authority over the earth, possessor of the earth. And he had Abram split these sacrifices. And then the devil sent some birds down to consume the carcasses. The devil is trying to steal. The, he's, oh, no. God is about to enter into covenant with man. No, we can't let that happen. So he's sending the birds to try and steal the meat from the sacrifices. And Abram's job was to drive them away. Abram had the responsibility of guarding the sacrifice, guarding the promises of God, guarding the covenant relationship with God. Abram had the responsibility to do that, just like you and I have the responsibility of guarding the word that has been planted into our heart. If we neglect to guard the word that's been planted into our heart, the devil can steal it from our heart. We need to be like Abram and guard that word that's been sown into our very beings by God himself. Amen. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Hallelujah. All right. When the sun went down, a deep sleep fell upon Aaron. In other words, he went into a trance and seen a vision. All right? And God said to Abram, Know a surety, or know for sure, that your descendants shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve the people there. And these people shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall be serving, I will judge. There will not be a, a, a rebellion, a mutiny, or anything like that. God says, I will judge them at the end of the 400 years. And after the 400 years, they shall come out with great substance. And if you read the Exodus, that's exactly what happened. All right? It says, but you shall go to your fathers in peace. You won't have to. You know, you're going to, in a good old age, You'll be buried in a good old age. You'll be going in peace. You won't see any of what I'm about to bring on the people here. In the fourth generation, they shall come here again. For iniquity of the Amorites has, is not yet full. And it shall come to pass. Oh, it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was now dark. you got to remember, there were no street lights in those days. All there was was possibly a campfire. Abram has been sitting there amongst this dead carcasses in the heat of the day all afternoon long. Do you know how bad that is going to stink? And some people, especially if you're raised in the city and weren't into hunting or anything like that, you don't know how that the stench of even a fresh kill when you're gutting it open and cleaning it, how bad that smells. Could you imagine after letting it sit in the heat of the desert all day long? And it just wasn't a little bird or a rabbit or anything. I mean, you're talking some serious meat here that was starting to decompose. Oh, man, that had to stink. That represents sin. It stinks to high heaven. And God came down in the flesh, just as he did in the burning lamp that Abram seen, walking amongst the pieces, walking amongst the stench of sin that is in this earth. God himself came down and walked in the stench of the sin of the earth. That's what Jesus did. Amen. He represented Jesus there. But in Abraham's heart, when he seen God himself come down and walk between the people, which that's what the two covenant people were supposed to do, is walk 
between the sacrifices, their footsteps in the blood, symbolizing, I will spill the blood of my family and our possessions in order to fulfill your covenant. When Abraham seen God do that, that sealed the deal in his heart. As far as he is concerned, he is now in covenant with Jehovah Yahweh, the Most High God himself. And there is not one thing that God cannot do. He feared nobody. <laughs> At least that's the way it's supposed to work. But anyway, God entered into covenant with Abram. That sealed the deal in Abram's heart. Turn over to chapter 17. Hallelujah. Uh, well, verse 1. Well, God said and promised him, your descendants will inherit all this land. So they went in, and this was not an immaculate conception. Abram and Sarai tried to have children, and it just wasn't working. Things were not working right. So Sarai comes up with the plan, go in with Hagar, my maid, Ray, we'll you know, get her pregnant, we'll have the baby, we'll raise it as our own. And an Ishmael was born. That was not God's plan. Not at all. That's what happens when people who know God's will, but are being impatient in God's will, try to force things to happen to fulfill God's will. And Ishmael is born. You know, we just had a, a board of directors meeting. And for the past several years, we've held an annual meeting for our partners, and especially in the Baltimore area. There was open to anyone, but it's mainly for Baltimore. And this year, I felt the Lord saying, we don't need to do that this year. We, we have to refocus the energies on other things. But we've done it for several years, Lord. And, you know, we established good relationships and, and we tried pushing it. So let's let's put it over here. And then that didn't work out, that location. So let's put it over here. And that didn't work out, the second location. And the Lord brought me back to this. He says, don't try and create an Ishmael. And I explained that to our board of directors. And they're like, yeah, okay, we can see that. All right. So we're going in another direction this year. But the point being, when you try and force something, you're going to give birth to an Ishmael. Let God be God. Yes, there's still work involved. Abram and Sarai, it was not an immaculate conception. There was work involved on Abraham's part, and there's work involved on Sarai's part. And the result was in Isaac, once they gave God permission to do so. And here in chapter 17, we see that when Ishmael was born, if you read through the scriptures, you can see that God did not speak to Abram for what? 13 years. And then the Lord said, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord shows up again and said to him, I am the almighty God. That's El Shaddai. In other words, I, El Shaddai is the one, you know, your provider, right? And he says, walk before me and be perfect. It's going back to the covenant again. I will make my covenant between you and I and will multiply you exceedingly. And then Abram fell on his face as God was talking with him and said, as for me, my covenant is with, me, with you. And God saying, speaking to him, he said, uh, my covenant is with you and shall be a father of many people groups, nations. Your name shall no longer be called Abram. Your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. In other words, you're not just going to have one kid. You're going to have a lot of kids, a lot of descendants. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between you and I and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant that I will never break. I'll be a God to you and to your generations after you. I will give to you, I'll give to your generations after you the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession 
I will be their God. And God said to Abram, Abraham, because he just changed his name, they shall keep my covenant, therefore, you and your descendants after you and their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between you and I and your descendants after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between you and I. He that's eight days old and is circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that's born in your house or bought with money of bought with your money from any stranger which is not of your descendants. He that's born in your house, he that's bought with your money, all of them need to be circumcised. My covenant shall be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. The uncircumcised man whose foreskin is not circumcised, that person shall be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her Sarai anymore, but Sarah shall her name be, which means she is a princess. And I will bless her, and I will give you a son from her, Yes, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed. Abraham laughed at God and said, Shall a child be born to him that's a hundred years old? Are you kidding me, God? Nobody can do that. Yeah, you know. What have you been smoking? And Sarah, she's 90 years old. She gonna she, she can't even bear children. She's not bear she hasn't bore me a son or even a daughter. How's she ever gonna get pregnant now that she's 90? Come on, God. Don't lie to me. And Abraham said to God, just use Ishmael. May he live before you forever. And God said, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son indeed. You will call his name Isaac. And I'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now, as for Ishmael, since you know, you've asked me to bless him, okay, I've heard you. And I will bless him. And he goes on to you know, talk about all that. And then God left off talking with Abram. Abraham and went up from him. Those that went up from him. So if God had to go up, first he had to come down to talk with him. Amen. So Abraham took his whole family, circumcised them, and all that. Now turn over to Genesis 22. We see where God had came down as he's dealing with Sodom and he told Sarah, you know, this time next year, you're going to have yourself a son. She laughed. And I went through last time, you know, one time I was preaching, and, and I asked this the whole crowd, there was a couple thousand people there, I guess. And I said, how many grandmothers we got out here today? And they all raised, you know, grandmas raised their hand. I said, you know, what if your husband went home tonight and said, you know, I was hearing that preacher today, and I think God spoke to me and said, we're supposed to have another baby. And they started laughing. And most of us, it ain't going to happen with me, Jack. Go find someone else. And I said, you laughed, but yet we get angry at Sarah when we read she laughed. She's thinking the same thing you are. And that kind of, you know, I got one of them, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good moments. Amen. So we see now that uh, Isaac's born. Most estimates say that he was somewhere between 12 and 17 at this point in time. Old enough to know the covenant that Abram and Abraham made with God. Old enough to understand what sacrifices are. Old enough to understand the importance of sacrifices and the importance of the covenant. And God appears to Abraham and says, I want you to take your only son that you love, Isaac. And I want you to, to go, I want you to take him to a mountain that I'll show you. He didn't even tell him where it was. Just start walking. I'll tell you when you're there. And I want you to offer him there as a sacrifice on the top of that mountain 
to me. Now, Abraham in his natural mind is thinking, How, wait a minute, God, you never asked me for a human sacrifice ever. And you're the one who said that through Isaac would be the descendants that would come from me. But if I kill him and offer him as a sacrifice there, how's that going to happen? You never lied to me. Matter of fact, you can't lie. So if the promises that you've given to me about generations full, shall flow from me, they'll inherit this land, and it starts with Isaac, how is it you want me to sacrifice him? God, I don't understand this. But he was in obedience. He did not say anything. He didn't go discuss it with Sarah. Ha! That would have killed the whole deal right there. Think about it. Mama bear syndrome. Do you think she'd have let this 120-year-old man take her baby that she gave birth to at 90? Do you think that Sarah was going to stand by and let Abraham go and kill Isaac on top of a mountain? Uh-uh. So notice when God said this, uh, verse 6, Abraham said, well, I'm sorry, where did we get here? Okay, verse 2, as God told him to go, verse 3, Abraham rose up early the next morning and took the son and the couple servants and the ass, and off they went, probably while Sarah is still asleep. You know, she was one hot mama when he woke up. Oh, she would be so angry. But she probably figured, possibly Abraham said, God wants me to go make a sacrifice on his mountain. He's going to show me. We're going to go. We'll come back. She might have said okay to that. Either way, he didn't tell her the whole deal. And off he goes. Isaac's old enough to understand about sacrifices, for he asked him, he says, I see the fire. We were taking the fire and, and the kindling, and, and we got all that. We got the fire and the wood. But we didn't, we, Dad, you forgot to take a goat. How, well, what, what are we going to offer as a sacrifice? And that's when Abram said, God, in verse 8, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they went on together. And he told his servants, you wait here. Me and the lad are going to that top of the mountain right there. And we'll come back to you again. We will come back to you again. He's already got it figured out in his mind. If God is going to be keeping his end of this covenant, and God cannot lie, he said, through Isaac shall my descendants be called. I'm going to hold the most high God in existence responsible for the fulfillment of his end of this bargain. He said, through Isaac. All right, God, you said through Isaac. That means exactly what you said, through Isaac. But now you want me to offer Isaac as a sacrifice for a burnt offering on top of this mountain. There's only one way this is going to work out, God. Only one way. and that, You're going to have to raise Isaac from the dead. That's the only way Abraham could think in his mind that this was going to make any sense at all. But he was not going to speak his doubt. He had raised his right hand to God. He had sworn to God. God had sworn to him. He goes, I am not breaking my end of the covenant. Whatever God asked me for, I said I give. All right? He asked for my son. I'm going to give him my son. But he promised me Isaac would be the father of, you know, be the descendant, so it would make me the father of many nations. So I'm going to hold him responsible for up and upholding his covenant. And off they went. And they got to the top. They set everything in order. All is left now is to tie Isaac up and put him on the sacrifice. And it says here in verse 9, they came to the place that God had shown them about. Abraham built an altar there. The wood was laid in order. Then he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar full of wood. And verse 10 says, And Isaac was found three days later off in Damascus because he took off. No, that's not what it says. But think about what would happen if we 
in today's day and age tried to walk by faith like that. Like I said, Isaac, let's say he was 16, 17 years old. Abram's what, 116, 117? I have a feeling that Isaac could take the old man. And that's what would happen today if someone tried to do that. We'd be reading a different story. But, you know, and when Abraham woke up after being hit upside the head with a log, Isaac was nowhere to be found. That's not what it says. Verse 10 says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's getting ready to cut this boy in two because God wants the sacrifice. And just as he's raising that knife up, he got as close to the actual execution of Isaac as you could get. As close as you could get. A split second more, that knife would have come down. At that moment, God realized he is really going to do it. And said, Abraham, stop. He said, do not kill your son. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear me so much. Not fear like, oh, I'm so scared of you, God, but respect. You respect me so much. You respect the covenant that we entered into so much. You won't withhold anything from me. He said, I will no longer withhold anything from you, your descendants after you, or anyone who enters into this covenant with you. And he looked up and he seen the ram caught in the thicket. And that's where he swapped the sacrifice. The exchange took place. The lamb of God took, play, took the place of the required sacrifice of Isaac. Remember when I went back to the beginning of this story as we're getting ready to close. We got absolutely nowhere near where I thought we were going with this. Praise God. Somebody got it. Somebody, this blessed somebody. It blessed me just preaching it. Uh, remember when we started. If someone broke the covenant that was made, we talked about the, the farmer, the owner of the water and the owner of the sheep, how they all entered in a covenant one with another. And if someone broke the covenant, they would go to that family and say, your family broke this covenant. Now, we don't know who did it, but we know it was broken. And they provide evidence of it or whatever. Now, bring that person forward that broke the covenant and we'll execute him here. But we don't know who it is. All right? then you have to, the king the, of that tribe, what was the required sacrifice we said was common in that day? His firstborn son was the required sacrifice for the group of people that someone had broken the covenant. Otherwise, all the group of people was excluded from the covenant, and now they're on their own. You know, you get taken care of whatever best way you can. But you're not in covenant with us anymore because you broke it. Your family broke that covenant. If you want to restore into a covenant relationship with us, you must offer your eldest firstborn son as the sacrifice in order to reestablish the covenant. That's what Abraham was doing. He was offering his firstborn son that was born between him and Sarah, the promised child, Isaac, the child of promise, with whom God had sworn into covenant relationship with Abraham and his descendants after him. But because of sin, with Abraham's group of people, because of sin that was going to take place, God knew that covenant was broken. And that the only covenant thing that could restore Abraham's descendants, of which Christians are part of that group, the only thing that could restore that covenant relationship was the death of the firstborn son. And for us, 
That's Jesus. Because Abraham did not withhold Isaac. God said, I will not withhold anything from you. And when the time was right, Jesus was born as the firstborn child of the Most High God. Hallelujah. And walked this earth sinless, never broke the covenant. Therefore, he inherited heaven. Once he reached that age, he could go to heaven. Instead, God offered him as his lamb. He said, I will make this sacrifice for my family on this earth. This child, Jesus, was from the Abrahamic covenant. He could offer himself as the sin offering for the people of Abraham and of which we are part as Christians. God himself said, since he is my firstborn sinless son, I will offer him also. And together, Jesus allowed us to become one. The only way that could benefit you is if you receive Jesus as your Savior. That's the only way. There is no other way. And if you are ready to do that, I mean, God's already done his part. All you have to do is ask right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive you as myself. I receive Jesus as my sacrifice. I receive the covenant relationship reestablished with you that we just studied. And it's all because of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, folks, in all that you do.